Hi, my name's Michael Fudge. You probably know me as your professor from IST 256. I'm here today to talk to you on this cold wintry morning about charts. If you draw your charts by hand like I have behind me, then stick around because I'm about to show you how to do them in Python. Hi everyone and welcome to IST 256 Lesson 13 on Visualizations. Obviously this is a pre-recorded lecture and therefore you will not have to do the attendance links, the class chat, or the participation. There will be a scheduled time later where we will go into Microsoft Teams and have a Q&A session on this particular uh, lecture when we're done. So on the, the agenda for today is pretty much stuff that was based on the online readings. We're going to be looking at data visualization using three basic tools, Matplotlib, Plotly, and Folium. So let's start out, as we always do, with a connect activity. What is the purpose of a data visualization? Now, data, data visualizations help us find relationships or patterns in data and they help us and those patterns and relationships will help us discover meaning so really um, that's all three of these are the purpose of a, a data visualization the old adage is a picture is worth a thousand words and this is no different of course so information visualization is the study of visual representations of data to reinforce cognition we help people understand the structure, relationships, and meaning in data. And there's various techniques that we use for this. Charts, graphs, and maps. And we'll demonstrate all three of those techniques in a bit. So the first thing you might be wondering, if you've made it this far, is, you know, what parts of a visualization are there? And then which is the best visualization to choose? So let's start by looking at the parts of any visualization. Visual visualizations have a title usually it's at the top and then they usually will have um, at least two axis an X axis on the bottom and a Y axis on the side there can also be three dimensions but we usually don't want to do uh, a three-dimensional visualization they're generally um, too complicated and there's too much data in there and it's it's hard to visualize visualize unless it's some kind of um, terrain or contour so this particular visualization shows two sets of data, uh, the blue line and the orange line. These are called series. So one, of one, for example, in this case, the blue line represents sales and the orange line represents returns. So not only do you get to see the data independently, like, wow, the sales went down from October to November, but you also get to see the relationships between the data. Sales went down, but returns went down. And then in December, returns continued to go down, but sales went up, which I guess is, is a good trend. So what makes up the series are the individual data points, and these are labeled 4.5, 3.5, 1.8, etc. It's generally a good idea to label your data points so that you're not guessing what the data is when you're over here looking at the axis. Like, see, it says three, four, five, and so I know that this one's somewhere between four and five. Why not I just label it as four, three? So that's a, pretty much the anatomy of any visualization. So you might be deciding, what visualization do I use for the particular scenarios? There's lots of different kinds of visualizations. Now, this chart is great but it's also very complicated and it's probably more information that you need for this class. So let me try to distill it. Are you, um, are you comparing, uh, like for example, a set of values, right? Are you um, comparing those values uh, over time? When you're comparing values over time, generally you want to use lines. If you have um, more than one series over the same time, then you'll use multiple lines. If you have um, a comparison and the, the categories are discrete, then you want to use a bar. Okay, And that's also represented down here. Let's suppose you have a composition of data. Like, for example, you want to compare apples, oranges, and cherries, and you want to compare how many of them you have in stock. 
each of those apples, oranges, and cherries represents a particular um, category. So it's a good idea to use um, a column a column chart for that, right? So comparison among items, column chart. Now, when you have a composition amongst um, data that's changing over time, right? That's very similar to a line chart, right? But you have several of them, so you might stack them, right? So you have, for example, um, I want to calculate the number of cherries we sold over time, the number of apples, and the number of oranges. And then I want to also classify them as fruit and then look at the total number of fruit that are sold over time. So then there would be a stacked. So a stack is when you want to uh, quantify them. Now, when you want to compare two variables and how they relate to each other, you use a scatter plot. So on the x-axis, you put one variable and then y, you put the other. For example, you might compare the vehicle's mass on the x-axis to its miles per gallon on the right axis and then get a relationship of, you know, are the heavier cars, do they get poorer mileage? If you have three variables that you want to compare, um, you can use a bubble chart. What a bubble chart lets you do is have one axis here and then another axis here, and then the size of the bubble represents a third quantity. So it's a way of representing three relationships uh, easily. It's much better than using a 3D uh, chart, like what they have down here, a 3D area chart. <coughs> Generally, you want to avoid the pie chart um, unless you are comparing two values, yes or no, or maybe three values, yes or no, or maybe. Anything more than three values is too much for a pie chart. Use a bar chart or a column chart instead. So basically, if I may distill this, if you have categorical data, use a bar chart or column chart going horizontally or vertically, depending on how you want to go. If you um, have data that you're comparing over time, then you want to use a line chart instead of a column chart. It makes more sense to draw those as trends with a line chart. And if you have multiple series across time, you can use multiple categories of line chart. If you have two compare variables you're comparing to each other or three variables you're comparing to each other, then you want to use a scatter chart or a bubble chart. Anything else is probably beyond the level of what's expected in this course. So you're either going to stick to a bar chart, a line chart, a scatter chart, or a bubble chart. If you do decide to go the pi route, please keep your categories to three or less. Okay, remember pies are for Thanksgiving dinner. They're not for drawing. They're not for displaying information. Okay, let's do a quick check yourself, right? So A here represents the title, and then B represents the series, and C is the y-axis and D is the x-axis. And because this is data that is over time, right? September comes before October. October comes before November, right? There's a relationship with the values on the, on the, on the x-axis. They're not categorical. Therefore, I, I chose to use a line chart. I would choose a bar chart if, if September and October had no relationship to each other. Like for example, this was peaches and this was apples and this was Xboxes and this was Playstations. And I wanna know how many I sold. <laughs> There is no relationship between Peaches and Playstations, therefore the line makes no sense, right? You want to go with a bar instead. That's the difference between line and bar. Now in Python, there's, there's lots of packages you can use for data visualization. Um, the, the standard that I would say the most common one is matplotlib. It's Python's library based on MATLAB, so it has the same syntax as MATLAB, if you're familiar with MATLAB. It'll be very familiar to you. The problem is most of us are not familiar with MATLAB, so it is very unfamiliar to us. And then here's the official docs on that. And then another nice way to do plotting in Python is with a, a library called Plotly, which is a cloud-based uh, plotting as a service. And uh, with Plotly, you can plot with anything. It doesn't have to be with Python. It can be with any language you want. You can even just plot with Excel. Um, or just data that you find on the internet. So Plotly is very useful. Um, it does way more than just Python plotting, but it does Python, Python plotting very easily and very well. One important thing to note is they did change around Plotly from version three to version four, and now it uses something called Chart Studio. So a lot of the information I have in here um, still is relevant, but you wanna make sure you're looking up the Chart Studio docs in there. And then last, we'll look at Folium, which is a wrapper on OpenStreetMap, which is a free mapping service. And um, this allows us to create 
um, data that we overlay on a map. You can do this also in Plotly, but I think you have to have a license to do it in Plotly, which is why I don't um, choose that as an option. I like to try to keep my options free. You can also do the mapping in Matplotlib, but it's a lot harder. All right, so let's get into some demos. <clears throat> in each of these demos, I, I'm going to have a lot of the code written. And the reason for this is there's a lot of boilerplate typing. So what I'll do instead of doing that is it sort of explain the code. Um, you know, it's more of a watch me explain the code than watch me actually type the code. Uh, it makes a heck of a lot more sense to do that only because of just how, how much boilerplate is necessary to, to do basic things um, when you're plotting. So we'll start with matplotlib. And hang on a sec. All right, so I'm back out here at my in-class examples folder. And for this one, rather than just making a notebook, I made a whole folder called Lesson 13. And in this Lesson 13 folder, you'll see that there's a watch me code for matplotlib. There's a watch me code for plotly. There's a watch me code for folio maps. And these are, are were all rewritten by me so that they now work. There were some issues with them because of things that have been upgraded um, in Folium and Plotly, and I have now corrected those. So without further ado, let's get into matplotlib, and then we'll do Plotly and Folium, and then what we'll do is we'll go through the end-to-end -end example, and then I've got a surprise for you at the end. Okay, so basically when you're using matplotlib, if you want your plots to draw in the notebook, you have to put this inline directive in here. Now I think by default, I have this configured uh, to do this already. And I can try this out. I can turn that off and let's um, run this cell and then this cell. And it see, it does plot right in, in the notebook without me re doing this inline here. Um, this is useful to know because if you use some other notebook environment, they might not have configured the plots to go in line, which means when you run the plots, they're actually popping up in another window that you cannot see because they don't draw within the notebook. All right, so that's first things first. So let's talk about what you need to do to import things to do plots. So you need to import matplotlib. And then here I just have pandas and numpy, which these are part of pandas. And then this is me um, pulling in the plotter called pyplot, and I just rename it plot. And this is the, the, the base plotter for matplotlib. And then this is me configuring how big the plots are going to draw. I want them to be a little larger so that you can see them on my screen. So the easiest way to do a plot is um, you give it a list of values on the x-axis and you give it a list of values on the y-axis. So I have x and x squared. And then you just do, you say, please plot um, x against y. And by default, it does a line plot and um, the line is blue. So that's basically uh, doing a plot. Now, why does it show the plot? Because it's the last thing in the notebook, right? If I put a print after this, print, hi mom, right? It will not show, it will show hi mom, then the, then the notebook, right? Because it shows them, um, uh, in line. So it doesn't show them in the right order. If you want them to be in the right order, you have to use um, IPython display, but we'll get into that um, in a little bit. I just want to let you see how the plots are being drawn. So here's an example of the same plot, but I'm going to put in this RO. This RO is like a sub language for um, MATLAB that lets you configure how you want the plot to look. So this is, is using um, red dots. And so here's my red dots again, but then now I'm constraining the axis to values between zero and six. See, it goes from one to five down here on the X and zero to 26 on the Y. So I do that by putting in a list, X1, y, X2, Y1, Y2, to control um, the axes here. So to show you this in a little, I can go to 10 here and then go to 50, and this would be kind of silly because the points don't go that far, right? So I go to 10 and 50, but the points stop, you know, here. So it doesn't make sense to use all this extra space. So that's what using that axis function allows you to do is configure how that works. You can see what you're doing here in matplotlib is you're setting up the plotter, right? You're saying plot, 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 let's configure the axis, plot, let's show. You can add labels too. So you can say plot, plot, now I'm going to do red dashes and 
set my axis, then set my X label, set my Y label, set my title. Let's throw a grid down there for good measure, and then let's show the plot. There you go. <clears throat> so, you know, these are just strings. You can get them from anywhere. You know, I could go up here and say, you know, I wouldn't do this, but I could. I could say name equals, you know, input, enter, plot title and then instead of saying this I can say name and it'll work just the same right enter plot title Mike is awesome and then that's what it uses for the plot title right so I mean th just showing you the flexibility that is afforded to you you do not have to use static values in here these are all configurable all these values are configurable you can ask them to input the font size for example um, or whether or not they want to show a grid. You know, all these things are, are customizable by you. So let's look at some other uh, charts, right? So if I say plot bar, I get a bar chart, right? So I have um, the, my x-axis and my y-axis. Now, a bar chart is probably not a great option for this particular data set because there's a relationship between 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 and 3 and 4 and 1 and 4. But if these were categories, you know, like um, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, Tim Hortons, you know, that would be uh, different. That would, that would be more conducive to a bar chart. Uh, here's a pie chart. Again, um, you want to avoid using pie chart if you can. Now, all this garbage you see here, this is just because I'm calling plot directly. If I were to go like import um, from, let's say from IPython display, import display, and then I don't just echo out the pie, pie chart, but I call the display function like that. Um, oh, I still get it. Interesting. I wonder if it's because I'm not using show. Maybe I'm going to do um, plot pie and then display plot show. Call the show function to show the plot. There we go. So that's how you do it, right? <coughs> pie chart. Now you might want to label these and things like that. Again, you want to do that. You want to bring up help on plot pie. You want to go to a cell, type in help, plot pie, and it's going to give you a bunch of stuff to read. Or you can go back to the PowerPoint slides here and read this. One way or another, you're reading something. You can't get out of that. Uh, here's a scatter plot, which is kind of the same as the line as the, as the uh, initial plot we had uh, with dots. So what's cool about Matplotlib is it works real well with uh, ugh, with pandas. So here's me importing a, an exam score data set, and I have like you know um, all these all these uh, values in here like student score. So I might want to plot a scatter of completion time against student score. So I gotta make sure these columns are right. See, it's completion underscore time. I need to change that. Completion, completion underscore time and student underscore score like that. And um, if I do that, I'll, I will get a scatter plot of completion time on the x-axis and student score on the y-axis. And what you notice is scores is the data frame. Scores is the data frame. And then I want to, I call a plot command. And then what kind of plot do I want? A scatter plot. And that's what's nice about pandas plus matplotlib. They kind of work together like chocolate and peanut butter make a Reese's peanut butter cup. So I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to make completion time and student score. And I'm going to leave these um, like this and then run that. And then, you know, I get uh, this font size a little large here. Maybe I went, I went overboard there. I'm going to make those 14 instead. 14. There we go. It looks a little better. Okay. So I can do th this particular example shows a bar chart of letter grades, right? So now and here I'm making a new data frame. So this is another uh, trick, right? So uh, if you look at, look at the original data set, I have um, letter grade over here, B, A, D, but I want to count them, right? I want to know how many B's are there. How many A's are there? How many D's are there, right? So I actually have to make another data frame here to do that. So this particular line here creates a data frame called letter grades. And um, it has one column letter. And that is the, the value counts letter, right? 
and that sorts it as an index, right? And so you're sorting it A, B, C, D, okay? And then I'm just plotting a bar from that. And whoops, I get a mistake because it's not called, the column is not called letter grade. So you look down here, you'll eventually see key error letter grade. Um, that's not a column in the data frame. The column is called letter underscore grade. See that? So I screwed that up. I'd like to say I did that on purpose, but I know I didn't. Now, if you're confused by this line above here, letter grades, let me do this. Let me do letter, letter grades sample. And let me give you 10 of those. So you don't see them because it does this and then it does this, right? So you can't show them both. So to show them both, you need IPython display again, right? So I need to display, I better probably make this work all in one cell, from IPython display, import display. And then rather than echoing them, I'm gonna call display. Display that and then display that. This is important for your final project if you want to make, for example, here's my data frame, and then here is my histogram of letter grades <coughs> for that uh, data frame, for that data frame, right? So data frame, letter grades. Now, if you don't want to see this again, you have to call um, show, right? So I might do the plot like that. And we'll just leave it the way it is for now. That's pesky to do in the data frame, but that's fine. So I got my letters here and then my values here. Now this last example just shows you how to um, put some labels down on a pie, right? So there's your there's your pie and there's your labels. Again, very ugly pie chart. Way too many categories. Doesn't really tell you much. When in doubt, avoid the pie. That's basically matplotlib. There's a lot more to it than that, but I think if you're going to do anything in matplotlib, you're either going to do a scatter plot, right, or a line plot like this, or a bar plot like this. Okay, you're going to keep it simple. Okay, I don't expect you to do much more beyond beyond that. So let's suppose you want to kick your um, your interactivity up a level. What can you do? Well, let's take a look at Watch Me Code Two. I'm going to just kind of give up on presenting this here. Uh, let's take a look at Watch Me Code 2, which looks at Plotly. I'm going to close that. Um, let's save it. Some good stuff in there. And here's uh, Watch Me Code 2 with Plotly. So you have to um, install Chart Studio because when we set up your, your um, notebooks in the cloud environment, we installed Plotly, and Plotly is kind of the old version. And in between the time that we set it up and now, they now have this Chart Studio that they're using. So you have to run this um, this command. That little bang in front says, "Go out to the shell, uh, the command line, and run it." So it runs it from the command line and does a pip install. And you can see I've already done it. And then I have a whole bunch of imports. Now, normally you don't need all these imports, but I'm going to be using these all in one place or another eventually. Let me just talk about them. I'm renaming Chart Studio to Plotly because that's what I'm used to. I'm used to calling it Plotly. Um, and then I'm actually importing from Chart Studio Plotly. Plotly is a, um, a an object inside of Chart Studio, and I'm going to call that PY. And then I'm going to Plotly Express is like a shorthand way to um, plot with a data frame. It kind of replaces Cufflinks, which is what uh, we used to use to do that. But Plotly Express is a new way to do that. And then I have this for building graph objects. Now, a graph object is a, is a means to display something on your chart. So in Plotly, the metaphor is you make the, the chart surface, then you put one or more graph objects on the chart. And then, of course, I got our good friend pandas here. So let's start out. When you start with, chats, uh, with uh, Plotly, you need to get a, a login. And the easiest way to do that is if you go to um, the link that I gave you, you see I'm already logged in, right? So let me log out here. Um, you want to use Plotly, you go to sign in and uh, you hit Google, right? And then just log in with your GCREDU, right? That's what I'm doing. I'm just going to log in with this GCREDU account, right? That uses my net ID and password and then boom, I'm in. Uh, when you're in, you'll, you'll go up here and you go to settings and it'll have a um, API key. 
and then this is your username, and then this is your API key. And the first time in, you have to hit regenerate key and it'll give you um, the text of your API key. And then that information needs to get put uh, in here. And then that sets what's called your credentials file that allows you to use the Plotly API. Okay, so this is basically set up. You gotta do this uh, to use it. I'm gonna run this first, uh, then I run this. And now I'm ready to go. So let's do a real simple example. I'm going to make a data frame here that has some subjects. These are categories and then some values of the grades. And then I'm just going to run it and I get a data frame, right? And so this is a perfect example of a bar plot, right? You don't want to plot this as a line because there is no relationship between history and English, right? So there's separate categories. So basically how you do this in Plotly is as follows. You um, use the graph objects and make a bar chart. And um, the data that you do when you call plot in Plotly, um, that data is always a list. See that it's a list. So this is a list of one item. And that one item is the, the graph object bar. And it has for the X axis, whatever the subject is out of the grades data frame. So these values are on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, I want to use the grades themselves from that data frame. And so I call that grade data. It's a list of um, <clears throat> graph objects. And then basically, this is boilerplate. When you want to plot with Plotly, you're pretty much going to copy this and then replace all these values with what you want. You know, this is going to be your graph object list. And then this is going to be your x-axis, y-axis, and titles. And then you run it and then it cranks away, and then in the cloud, it builds you the chart and then puts it in your Jupyter Notebook. And you can see Plotly is a little more interactive, right? So you can hover over these values. Um, I can zoom in on two values that I care about. Um, I can double click and zoom back out again, <laughs> which I forgot how to do. It does, it's not letting me do that, even though it said to do that which I guess I could just rerun my plot. Now, the one gotcha with Plotly is every time you plot something, what it does is in the Plotly dashboard, it generates a file. See all these files, right? See all these, right? I'm going to put them in list view. And so you only get like 25 of these before you run out. So you have to kind of go in here routinely and just delete them. And it doesn't matter if you delete them out of here because your code in your notebook generates them, right? This is just um, the Python puts them in the Plotly service and then the Plotly service um, then draws them back in the notebook. And so the heavy lifting is being done by the Plotly service, um, <coughs> excuse me, but you only get 25 of those. But if you delete them, um, I can always rerun them. Right, and then I rerun it, and it re goes back to the Plotly service, recreates it, brings it back down again. And when I go back here, I'll now see that it's it, I now have that new plot in here. There it is, right there. Okay, so it's no big deal. If you run out, you just delete them, and it's not going to harm anything by deleting them because your code can always recreate them. Okay, so let's do a couple of other examples. Okay, so I want to do this plot again, but I'm going to use Plotly Express now. Plotly Express lets me kind of do this as a one-liner. So PX bar, Plotly Express, draw me a bar. Use this data frame. On the x-axis is the subjects column. On the y-axis is the grades column. And then I, I use my title. Now, what's kind of neat about using um, Plotly Express is I don't have to go through and, and yank it out of the data frame like this. Right, I can just go ahead and say, um, you know, use, you know, use use the column subjects out of the data frame here. But it's sort of the same thing. It's just a little more condensed, uh, but it does exactly the same thing. You'll see that um, I so, sort of fall onto um, using Plotly Express because you know I don't want to have to mess around with all this boil boilerplate and calling iplot and all that stuff. Okay, let's do another um, example. So let's show you how you know I, I mentioned that you have a list up here, right? It's a list of um, graph objects, right? So this is a great example of a multi-series plot. So I'm gonna take this weather data here, and this weather data, <coughs> excuse me, is time series. It has a uh, timestamp, and that is the max temperature, mean temperature, min temperature. 
<clears throat> and I want to plot all three of those temperatures on the same graph chart. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign them colors. So uh, red's going to, um, R is going to be red, G is going to be green, B is going to be blue, and they're just dictionaries. This is just me way, a way of creating a dictionary where the key is color and the value is blue. That's all. It's the same thing as doing this. Color blue. It's just another way <clears throat> to represent that. Okay, does the same thing. And then I'm going to make my list of graph objects. And I'm going to have one scatter, a second scatter, a third scatter. And then this one's going to be, um, x-axis is going to be the date each time. The y-axis is going to be the max, the mean, and the min temperature. And then I'm going to pick, I want lines, lines with markers, lines, and then I want the marker to be red, green, blue. And I'm going to use max temp, mean temp, min, min temp. And then I'm going to pass <clears throat> this into the same boilerplate I plot with different titles and then the different grade data. And then what I get is this, a time series of weather data from that data frame. And so you can see that, <clears throat> you know, in the summer, it gets warmer as it should. But you can see that on May 23rd, uh, there was a 34 degree minimum temperature um, and a 49 degree mean temperature and a 64 degree, um, if I can get on it, 62 degree max temperature. And then the next day, well, maybe in a couple days, it shot up to 87. So it's kind of cool. And you can zoom this in again if you want to want to take a look at it, right? So it's down here and then, you know, May 20th and then five days later, boom, up to 80, 87. Welcome to the wonderful, wacky world of spring in Syracuse, New York. So this gives you an example of how you can plot that. Now, you the, see the green one has dots on it, right? That's because I chose lines plus markers. So you might be wondering, Mike, how can a mere mortal like me, you know, know all of these named arguments to put on here? Again, you have to go read the help. Okay, if you type in help, go scatter, I'll, I guess I'll give you an example, right? If I go down here, just open up a new one of these, move it up. And if I do, you know, help, go scatter, like that, um, it brings up my help. You know, and I have to go through and read this, you know, and just figure it all out. And there's a lot of information here to read, right? So if you're wondering, you're like, what is group group norm what is that you got to go down here and find it and read about it okay there's a fill you know fill solid color right group norm only relevant when stack group is used so i didn't use scap group so i'm not using group norm okay hover info right it determines what you're going to have on on hover right so i could try to uh, go up here in my code and change my hover and right now my hover is showing dates right so I can, I can try to change that hover info up here just by adding it. Mike. Let's put in Mike for my hover info. Oh, I screwed something up. <clears throat> oh, yeah, it's got to be a list. You know, it's got to be um, some kind of... Um, I should have read more details on it, but it's got to be, you know, something from the data frame, obviously. I can't just use a name. It's got to be... Um, a value that comes from the data frame. I won't mess around with it, but you know that you get the idea, right? You have to kind of go through and read all these things, and then and then sort of figure them out from there. So a good place to go is there. You can also go online um, with the link I gave you here. These links will get you going um, with Plotly, right here. Okay. Moving on. So uh, let's go down here and do another example. This one down here will pull in a student data set and I'll do another scatter here to show you. There's a scatter plot. This is a 3D, um, um, a three-dimensional scatter. I have, I have um, uh, on the X, the letter grade, on the Y, the how long it took them to complete the exam. So like, you know, this person got an A and it took them um, 30 minutes to complete. This person got an A and it took them 60 minutes to complete. This person got an F and they didn't use all their time, right? So I'm trying to, is there a correlation between how good you did and, um, you know, what your score is? And then the, the bigger the bubble is, the higher the score, raw score you got. So as you can see, you can put a lot of different 
um, you can put a third dimension in here, which is like, you know, oh, this person scored really well. You expect the bubbles to be bigger as you go over here into the higher letters, obviously, than over here. But I just wanted to show you that you can add a third dimension in there. Um, there's other kinds of plots. There's not just scatter plots and bar plots. Like here's a heat map. And I, I encourage you to go explore these and figure out, you know, what it is you want to do um, in here. So this one, for example, shows you, you know, again, here's categories, exam version A. And then this is how long it took them to complete the exam. And then uh, this is the scores they got. So like you can see that, you know, exam version A, you know, somebody got a 30. A lot of people did well on exam version A, but there's one person that got a horrible uh, um, score on exam A. <laughs> so, I mean, you can use these any way you see fit. It's just important to be careful with uh, picking um, which version um, you're going to use. Now, when you're running this, you might get this request entity too large. This is what happens when you load a lot of things into your notebook at once, like all these resources are in this notebook, and now it won't save it anymore. Um, so what you have to do here when this happens is just go to cell and then just clear your output. Go to all output clear, and then uh, you should be able to now save um, the notebook because it doesn't have all that, um, all that other information um, with the plots. These other examples here I'm going to skip. They're just really basically showing you other ways to, to draw the same thing. So this one here, you know, just kind of grabs some data um, on life expectancy. And then it draws a plot, uh, a scatter plot, right? And then uh, this does the same thing, but it uses, um, it uses the Plotly um, extension instead, okay, to do it. And I put two together just to show you that you can plot two things together if you want. So there's one, I put the names on there, which is kind of rough, right? And then this one is the same thing, but I didn't put the names on there. It gives you a good good idea of that. Okay. So let's move on to using um, maps now. Let's go on and do some map examples with Folium. So Folium should be installed as well, but if not, you can use this pip install Folium to put it on there. And when you import, um, when you use Folium, you just have to import Folium. And I'm importing some other things in here just to, you know, have a good time. And right here, I, what I had to do was find the center of the U.S. And then I asked to create a map um, from Folium with the, the location as the center of the U.S. And I start at zoom level four. And when I do that, I get this. So I can change the location to something else. Like I'm going to change the location to London. And then uh, run the map, and now it's centered on London, right here. Now I can also zoom it in, right? I'm at zoom level four. You see, it takes a while to draw the pieces of the map. Um, but I can change the zoom level to twelve and zoom right in on the street levels of of London. Maybe it just takes a sec because I think my internet connection is a little slow right now. Okay. It would normally um, render the map. It just takes a little bit of time to do that. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on here. I'll go back to center U.S. <laughs> okay. <coughs> now let's pull in some data, and this this data has. Um, oh, there we go. It finally drew the center of the U.S. at zoom level 12, right? So I'm I'm right there in the middle of Kansas somewhere. See that? If I zoom out, you'll see, oh, yeah, Mike's in Kansas somewhere. Guess I am in Kansas anymore. You can add pins to a map. So this example, I pull in some data, and I have latitude and longitude. And then you have to loop over your data frame. And this is where you're going to use, like, two records, right? So two records converts your data frame into a list of dictionary. And um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a coordinate you know, a latitude and longitude out of the rows lat and the rows long. I'm going to make a position and then I'm going to um, make a marker. And um, that marker is going to have a position and then the pop-up label is going to be the city and state. So this is just me using, um, you know, a format string to do that city comma state. And then I, I take that map and I add a child uh, marker. So it's going to loop through and then add each marker from the data frame. So it'll add this marker, add this marker. It just does all of them. 
when you're done, you get this. So you get a map, and uh, on the map are little pins, and the pins represent the latitude and longitude of the places, and when you hover over them and click on them, you get a city and state. So students like to use this with um, <laughs> location services, like um, there's the, the one of the Hello World kind of pro, uh, things that students have been doing um, for their projects that we ask you to kind of kick up a notch because it's been done so many times before is they'll, for example, let you um, search Yelp for like pizza joints and then they'll just plot all the pizza joints on a map. And then when you click on them, you can, you know, read information about each of the pizza places. So that's, you know, pretty easy to do um, in Python with Folium. Um, you can you can crank something like that out in about, you know, 20 lines of code. Um, which is why it's a pretty simple group project if you did something like that. Okay, so let me give you an example of um, you can switch these pins around, right? So when you when you use these pins, here's a list of all the possible colors of the pins. I got that from the docs, and I'm doing the same thing, but now I'm just giving it a random color. And then I also picked an icon. There's a bunch of different icons you can set for the pins, and then you can see, you know, these are all user icons uh, for these pins. You can see I go down here and there's just they're different colors. And when I run it again, they would be it would just use different colors the next time I ran it. Run it again here. Oop. See I just zoomed in too far. I zoom out. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. There we go. There we go. So there we go. Now they're different colors. Remember the ones in New York were blue and now they're they're different colors here. All right, so here's me not using a pin, but using um, what's called a circle marker. So it's just a different way to represent a location. So I have this circle marker here. And if you hover over it and click on it, and you can get the name of the city. Jersey City, Cleveland, Syracuse. Okay. So there's a neat thing you can do that you've probably seen a lot of. It's called a, a a choropleth, and a choropleth is a way to overlay um, your data through a geographic boundary. So what you need is a, is a, a boundary file, and um, the boundary file that I found on the internet is called um, US States JSON. And if you were to open this up and look at it, um, you would see that it is a, a dictionary, and then in there is a list of all these different points. And if you, follow, if you trace these points, they will outline the state of Alabama in this case. And so here's the points for Alaska, and you can see there's a lot. So someone went through, <coughs> excuse me, and did all this for our pleasure so that when we use it in, um, when we use it in Folium, we can do something like this. I'll give you an example here. All right, so this one here. <clears throat> nope, I got to get my state data first. So let's load my state data. So this code here, um, all it does is it grabs from the internet these states and um, some counts here for these states. And then, you know, we're just grabbing um, and merging these counts. And then we're going to go through and plot it on a map. And so you, what you get here is this is a list of all the states and then how many website visitors we had. And you can see my website doesn't get a lot of visitors. Got a couple people from California and then a couple people from New York and one or two from Virginia and Ohio and, and that's it. And again, this is a real, <clears throat> real simple uh, example. But the chloropleth, the magic of the chloropleth is it outlines the state of California. And then when you associate the data point with California, it then fills it in accordingly. So this is a better example of how that might work. This example here uses unemployment data that's available on the web. And um, then I use my chloropleth. And then down here, what I'm doing is I, I make my chloropleth with my boundary file and my data. And then I say, um, you know, the columns that you're going to use are state and unemployment. And you're going to key on um, the state, right? The state is what um, gives you the boundary. And then unemployment gives you the data. And then I'm going to fill this in in yellow green. So yellow is low, green is high. Um, and then I add that to the map and then you get this and there you have it. So, you know, high unemployment going on over here, right? Relatively low unemployment in Nebraska in North Carolina, uh, uh, North 
Dakota. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's that's basically a chloroplast for you. Now, you can get other boundaries as well. You can get boundaries of Europe. You can get boundaries of world countries. There's, there's lots of ways that you can do this. So I encourage you to explore this. You can also make your own chloroplast. You know, you can you can find a chloroplast that has probably like uh, congressional district boundaries, um, but you can also again build your own chloroplast. It's pretty simple uh, to do because all you need to do is make that that boundary file to to do that. So you can re re slice things up any way you want. Okay, so that's basically folium. So let's do our um, end to end example. Okay, and in this end example, we are going to take this data set here, um, Syracuse Roads Challenge, which contains um, some data about potholes in Syracuse, New York. And what we will do is plot that data um, on a map so we can see where those potholes are. It's basically what we're going to do. All right, let's kind of do the whole thing from scratch to give you a better idea um, how, it, how it all works. All right. This will be a, a great way for you to sort of figure out if you're going to do this in your project, how you might approach it. So I'm going to import Folium and then import Pandas as PD. And I'm going to really try to do all of this in one cell for better or worse. It's hard to do because you really have to figure things out as you go, but what I'll do is I'll figure them out as I go and then keep pasting them up into that front cell. All right, so I run that, that's good. That should, that should load in what I need. Now I need to figure out where the middle of Syracuse is, which I've already done in cooking show style. So Syracuse, the latitude and longitude for Syracuse um, is 43, I got this off of Google. 430481 lat and then minus 76 1474 long. And so let's try this. Um, let's say um, sear map is folium map location sear. And let's start a zoom start. We want to get in real close 14. And then let's just see what the SEER map looks like. There we go. So there I am, right in on Syracuse, New York. I can see right down to the street level. So I can even get, I can get even closer if I really need to. But that, that should be good for starters. Okay. <clears throat> now I need to read in my pandas data. So I'm going to um, do potholes is uh, pd read read csv. And the URL that I need, I just grabbed this earlier, so I'm just going to paste this in, is that. And let's just make sure this works. Potholes sample. Give me like 10 potholes. Um, yeah, I screwed something up. It's sample without an S mic. There. So there's some, there's some potholes. There they are. Now let's um, <clears throat> let's take these potholes and stuff them on a map. Now there's a lot of potholes here, so what I'm going to do is only I'm only going to put like a hundred or two hundred on the map because we don't want to sit here and watch the it take. It takes forever for the map to draw other otherwise. Um, but let's let's write the code here. So I need to go over the pothole as record. So I'm going to say four um, row in potholes sample let's grab I don't know 200 and then let's turn that into records that way I can loop over them and I'm gonna do this I'm gonna um, say my my coordinates is gonna be the row and then it's this column here latitude Latitude, <clears throat> row, longitude. I think the way that this works, by the way, is um, 
the longitude goes first. Oh, these are mislabeled, by the way. See, this one says latitude. This is the problem. See, it says latitude here. This is actually the longitude. And this says longitude. This is actually the latitude. This is like an error in the source of the data. It's not a, a problem that we made, but I did notice this before. Um, so I'm actually going to call this um, latitude. This is going to be longitude here. I probably should fix that in the source data or let the, let the owner of the data know that it's not right. Because um, we certainly don't want to do it this way, because um, it would people would assume that you know you've got this backwards. But I have to do it backwards because th these are backwards in here. This is actually actually a longitude here. That value is a longitude, and that's that's a latitude. Okay, <clears throat> let's make the marker. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's say the location. The pin. Was well, I call it the pin? The pin is going to be. Um, Let's take um, this and then this and put them together. So the pin's going to be, let's make an F string and let's do um, row, row, stir location. And then we'll also put in row. Row. Oh boy. Row this. Okay, and we're going to set that to our pin. <clears throat> now let's make a marker. Marker. Uh, folium. Let's make a circle marker. And let's do location is going to be my coordinates. And my radius of the marker is going to be, I don't know, let's do 10. I don't know. I, this is the number I always can get confused on. And then the, the pop-up is going to be that pin. That's what I want to see on pop-up. And then let's make the color of the circle. I don't know. Let's just pick one of these HTML colors here. <clears throat> and then the fill color is going to be this guy. These are just colors that I grabbed um, grabbed off the internet. They're, it's a blue. And then inside the loop, we need to say seer map dot add child, and then let's add that marker. So every time through the loop, we're going to get the coordinates, get the pin, make a marker, add the marker. And then when we're all done, let's take a look at the seer map. And you can see in 12 lines of code, I, I've now plotted these potholes. If you go see, there's little dots for the plot for the potholes. And if I tap on them, I see where they are. This is at 338 Onondaga Street and State Street, and it was found on 511 216 at 847 a.m. So I get a I get a list of these. Now maybe you don't like the color I chose because it blends in with the parking too much. So you can go up here and change that. If I want more red in it, uh, this number's red, this number's green, this number's blue. So let's put more red in here. I'll change these all the way to F for because they're hexadecimal. So F. And then let's lower the amount of blue. Put them at zeros. I'll rerun that redraws my map and now they're like an orangey color see that there we go now this is like all capitals maybe I don't like that right I can fix that too like in here where I have stir location inside my f string I can say low I, I can do let's do um, title to title case it right let's see how that looks here There we go. Alverd Street and Laurel Street. See, I changed them from capitals to, to title. So, yeah, you can see, <clears throat> not hard to do. That's what I mean by, like, you know, like this same example with Yelp is really just, you know, type, what are you looking for? Pizza. Type, what's your city? You know, go find out, go get a data frame of stuff from Yelp and then print it out. You know, it's not that hard. But it definitely gives you an idea how to put things on a map using, using, pot, um, using um, Folium. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me.
As I alluded to earlier, I had something special planned for you, and that, that special thing I have planned is um, just a walkthrough of what a typical, of what a project might look like. I don't want to say it's typical, because usually what the students do is much of much higher caliber than what I'm going to show you. Um, what you're about to see probably falls in the high C to low B range, mostly because it just doesn't meet all the requirements necessary for, for a quality project. Mainly, I'm not doing anything outside of what we already learned in class. You need to show us that you can pick up on something independently and apply it. And the thing you pick up independently is not some new data set we didn't show you. Um, <clears throat> it has to be a programming technique we didn't show you. It has to be either um, you're pip installing something that we never showed you or you're using um, code in a way that, that wasn't explained in class. That, that is how you demonstrate independent learning to us. So my project will analyze user tweets from a data set. And I guess one way I could make it better is to maybe look at the sentiment of the tweets and then make, make form an opinion of like these people are saying things um, positive or negative and then sort of chart or graph that. But basically what I'm, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to just go over here to the sample project, is um, I'm going to read user tweets about a company, Fudgemart, and show uh, who tweeted the most and allow the users to select uh, a person and view their tweets. And like I said, this is pretty basic, about 20 lines of code or so. For a better grade, I might do sentiment analysis. I might take the user tweets, um, run them through an analyzer that says that's a positive tweet or a negative tweet, and then classify my users as positive or negative, and then let my, um, my interaction could be show me all the negative users and then let me see their tweets, or show me all the negative tweets from this user, or show me all the positive tweets from this user. Um, or I might have a, a chart of all the tweets, and then when you select a user, it makes a pie chart that shows, you know, 50% of these are 60% are, are positive, 40% are negative, or something like that. That would be a little more involved and, and achieve a much better grade than the code I'm about to show you. <clears throat> what is important about the code I'm going to show you is I'm going to make this entire thing run in a single notebook, and this is something that you should strive to do. While, while you'll build it across... Um, maybe several of these particular cells here, you should probably try You should try to get your code all run in one cell. All right, so let me just grab um, some boilerplate here. I'm gonna need, you know, I'm gonna need Plotly, um, Express, I'm gonna need Pandas, and eventually I'm gonna use IPython Display because what I don't wanna do is um, have to run these in multiple cells, okay? And then the last thing I'm gonna grab is where the, where the tweets are, so, you know, here's the data set that I found on the internet. This is something I made up, by the way. These are just made up tweets. So let's read in these tweets into pandas. So tweets, um, pd, read, json, and then let's see what we got here. Just give me like, I don't know, 10 of them. So there we go. So this person here said, came home to a big smile, my Fudge Mart package something, right? This is, I was very happy with the latest purchase from whatever. So they're all just kind of random, you know, tweets about a company, right? And this is actually used in one of my other courses to, to do um, some sentiment analysis. Even though it's not real, um, real data, it's made up data, it, it still can be used the same way. It's part of a lab activity. <clears throat> All right, so I got my tweets loaded into a data frame. One of the things I wanted to show was for each one of these users, like D to Lions, I want to show you how many tweets that person has, right? How many tweets does B to Hatchet have? <clears throat> to do that, I actually have to make another data frame that has one column user and another column, which is the count of, um, of tweets, right? Which would just be a count of that user because it's one row per tweet. So if I said tweets... And then I specify a user like this, and then do value counts. Remember this from before, value counts. I'm going to get um, that list, right? Bill me later, 24 tweets. B to hatch it, two tweets. All right. So the question is, how can I plot this, right? Well, to turn this into a data frame, if I say PD data frame, this, right? These are all things... I picked up from, you know, reading about pandas, especially Professor Fudge's, you know, um, reading on pandas. It explains how to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, you see I've built now a, a very basic uh, data frame 
um, of that. Now it, it is missing the user column, right? So I could add that user column back in there <coughs> by doing by doing something like this. I could say, well, the u the user column is going to be tweets user, and the tweets column. Let's just call it the count. Is going to be tweets user value counts and I think that will give me the data frame I want yeah so I have oh that did not work user count tweets user value counts <clears throat> let's do index Right, that should be right. I think that should be right. User. Oh, you know why? Because it's not matching them up on, see, like this is an index 0, 1, 2, and then this is index S bellum. So what I need to do is let's take the user value counts uh, index. So what? remember, you might be saying, what the hell did he just do, right? When you do value counts like this, you actually make a new data frame that has the value as this, and this is the index now. So I cannot make a data frame where user is one value, which has a different index. If you just look at tweets, right? The index of tweets is uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So I need that index to be user. So what I did was I made my data frame by saying uh, one column is user, and that's going to be uh, tweets user value counts index, right? So that's the same index that tweet user value counts uses. There's probably a simpler way to do this, but again, um, I just need to somehow slice up the turkey and I figured it out. So I'm not going to worry too much about it. So this is going to be a tweet. Uh, let's call it user counts. Okay. And I'm going to put that up here now because that's all good. And let's plot it. So let's do that down here. We'll run this first, make sure that runs still. Okay, and then down here, I'm going to plot it. So let's do px bar on a bar chart. And I want to uh, use the user counts as the thing I'm plotting. And I want the x axis to be user and the y axis to be count. Those are the only two things available to me in the user counts data frame. See how that looks. Grinding away at Plotly somewhere. And there we go. So there's all of my different users and their counts. And I might want to put a title on this. So how about tweets count by user name. And I got to put the word title in there, don't I? Title. Forgetting my named arguments. There we go. So there's my little chart. And um, now I want this up here. So, you know, that's going to be part of it. Okay. All right. So um, now we've got this little program. Loads of tweets. Gives me the chart. Now what I want to do is ask you to type in something like um, ray of light, you know, or tie a knot. And it'll show you their that person's tweets. Right. So I need something like uh, like this. I need to say... I don't know. Um, user input. Enter the user name to see their tweets. Right, and just to be safe, I'm gonna um, make force that to be lower, just in case you put it in uppercase. And uh, then what I need to do is I need to let's just make this really simple. How would I use user? It would be something like this. It would be uh, tweets. And then take tweets, user, and we want that to be equal to whatever the user is that you typed in. Okay, so this is just a filter of the data frame of those actual tweets by the user that you typed. So let's run that. And, um, oh, 
So I don't know if you noticed this, but it asks you for the username before it plots the bar chart. What the heck? And so I don't know any users, you know, and I don't see anything. So why doesn't this display? Well, this comes back to if you have more than one artifact that you want to display in the single cell, you have to use <coughs> IPython display. So I'm going to say display this. And then when I run it, there's my chart, right? And then now it asks me below that, and then I can type in, um, let me type in ACUS, A-K-U-S-S. -S. And then there's the tweets for ACUS. Now I don't need to show all of these columns for ACUS's tweets. I only wanna show um, the created at and text. <coughs> so I'm gonna apply another filter here, created at, and text. This is all standard panda stuff, right? So it's the tweets data frame, filter it on this condition, then only retrieve back a sub data frame of these columns. So I'm gonna run that. And let's put in um, B me later. And there's um, all of his tweets. Now, if you look, these are not in um, date order. See that? This is one of those things where if I was grading it, I would um, give you a demerit for not putting these in the right order. No one wants to look at date information out of order. So you should try to sort this uh, data frame. So this is where you use um, sort values. And again, it's just knowing all of these things or at least knowing where to find them. So I've written enough here where I'm going to call this um, user tweet. There's a lot here. So I'm just going to call it user tweets. And then the last thing I'm going to do is say display user tweets. Good. Run that. Enter username to see their tweets. I'm going to put in B-A-L-O-T-T. -T. And then there's bet a lot's tweets and they are in um, numerical uh, date order from earliest to latest. Now, <laughs> it doesn't show me the whole tweet, which is kind of annoying. It chops off the data frame. So we'll fix that in a minute, but we have other things that we need to fix because in order to get like the highest grade possible, you want to handle bad inputs. So when I run this, um, enter their tweets and I put in this, you know, it just does that, right? So I need to um, somehow handle the um, bad inputs, right? So one of the ways that I can do that is I need to check to see if the user that you input is, is in the list of possible users, right? So the list of possible users, what, what is that? Well, that is going to be, um, let's go to tweets, right? If we type in tweets um, user, right, um, that is a series, right? But I want the values out of that. And then that gives me um, a NumPy array, which is kind of the same as, uh, as a list of all of those values. So if I were to say, you know, is, is Mike um, in those tweets, it says false, right? But if I look for um, jpool in those tweets, it says true, right? So this is the expression that I use to verify that whatever they typed is in that list, right? <coughs> All right, so I figured that out. So I'm going to go up here and let's see, um, you ask for input and then you say, if user is in that, right, then figure out their tweets and display their tweets, uh, else you're going to print, and let's be very explicit because this is where you get the most points, user um, is not in the list of users. There run it again, enter and use it, see their tweets is not in the list of users there. I've got some basic, basic error checking in here, um, which is, which is really nice. So let's add a little more polish to this rather than show this data frame. Um, when I run it again and I put in, um, Balot, right? I see this data frame, but I can't like make any sense out of this because it gets cut off. So I'm gonna actually convert that data frame back to rows and loop over them with the print statement. 
So um, instead of displaying the data frame, I'm not going to do that anymore. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say for um, row in user tweets. Hopefully we've done this now enough where you know exactly what to do here. And you say two records. You say print. And let's use our famous F string again. Uh, row created at. That gives me the date. And then after that, let's put in row text. And let's see how that transpires. Uh, B A L O T T. So there, I get their tweet date and then their actual tweet. Now I'm going to um, jazz this up a little more. I'm going to put above this, you know, print tweets for, and then I'll just put the user in here that you typed. I run that, and then I put in T Panny, and it says tweets for T Panny, and I can see his tweets. Now, let's um, finish this up. I don't want to keep rerunning it, right? I want it to be interactive. I want it, once the application starts, I want it to run until the user decides that they're done running it. So this is where you're going to use, use an indefinite loop. So I'm going to take all of this stuff here, right? I'm going to display that initial chart. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put everything else in an indefinite loop like this. I'm going to say um, while true and then do all this, move that over, right? So now it's in a loop. And then I'll say enter your username to see their tweets, type chart or quit, okay? Now, uh, if user equals quit, then we want to break. And let's be fancy about it. Let's say print the program is over. How's that? Uh, and then we'll say L if user equals chart. Let's redraw the chart. So this command here redraws the chart. So let's put that there. And then let's change this if to an L if. So like, you know, if you type quit, the program's over. If you type chart, it redraws the chart. Otherwise, it looks for the user in the, the list of users and displays their tweets. Otherwise, it says you're a loser. You don't know how to type in the names right. And now that's in a loop. <coughs> and in pretty much 23 lines of code, we've written this entire uh, program. It's actually less than that because this is a comment and that's a white space. So it's really, you know, 20, 21 lines of code here. And I'm going to run it. And let me get rid of this to clean it up a bit. Okay, now it says enter usernames. I'm zoom it out so you can see it a little better. Okay, enter username T A N O T T. Okay, there's his tweets, right? And then maybe I want to see M Rofone. And I see um, his tweets, and then maybe I want to see the chart again. So it draws me the chart again. And then um, I can type in something that's not there. And it says not in the list of users, and I can do it again. And it's still just graceful, and then I can type in quit. And now the program's ended. So that's a great example of a final project that has um, some nice polish on it. It... Um, it runs and stays running until it's all over. It demonstrates um, some pretty good knowledge of how to use some things, by the way. It, it shows you, it shows your uh, evaluator that you can use pandas. It shows your evaluator that you know how to convert a data frame back into a list of dictionary to loop over it. It shows that you can um, um, read in data. It doesn't use an API, which this would be better if it used an API. It also plots things, which is really kind of cool. So this, it shows a lot where it would, where it could be better is like I said, if it did more, did something more interesting with the data, number one, um, and number two, didn't use a data set, but maybe used, used an API. But other than that, it's a, it's a great sample 
of what your code might look like um, in your project. Another thing that you want to do is probably use a function here. So you might be saying, well, which one of these could I put in, in a function? Well, which, which line of code repeats? Line 8 and line 15 repeat, right? So when you don't want to repeat yourself, when you have something repeating, you want to use a function instead. So how can I turn um, line 8 and line 15 into a function? Well, I could go up here and say, um, define a function called draw draw chart and what do i need to draw the chart i need um the user counts right i need the user counts and then drawing the chart is really just doing this right and then down here i'm going to say draw draw chart user counts and then the advantage of doing this is now this code here becomes draw chart right there and so i'm drawing the chart here i'm drawing the chart if i have to tweak the chart i only tweak it in one place i go in here and say tweet counts by username and it just fixes it everywhere so let's see there we go there's my chart drew my chart if i say chart oh, chart it draws the chart again. So, you know, this is kind of neat. It's a great example of, you know, how to put a program together. A couple of other ideas you can do, maybe things you could do, you can put in some commands here that um, change the way the chart looks or behaves. Maybe when you select a user, it shows another chart. Um, where students have done things like this in the past is you might have, you know, the first thing be a list of, like, for example, uh, movies and then when you pick a movie it shows you a list of actors then you can pick an actor etc um, and, and build things out that way another interesting thing that you can try to do with a project like this to sort of beef it up is as people select users you record them in a another chart and then you could build like a comparison chart so imagine that every time I pick a user here it shows me the tweets and then adds the user to a list and then it uses that list to draw another chart that just shows me the users that I care about in it. So that would be another great example of, of really showing us um, your Python, your Python skill set and, and, and how to um, apply the various things we learned in the class to, to the project. Okay, so I'll give you this code. Um, I hope I don't see a lot of final projects that use this code. Um, that obviously would be a very bad thing, but I imagine what you're doing is much different than this anyway. This is kind of a, a very rote and simple uh, example, but I, I would like to see you using data frames, using charts, um, figuring out how to use, how to filter data frames like I did here. This kind of code here, if you don't use a data frame to do this kind of code, this could take you a while. This you know, takes those tweets and then filters them on a user and then only grabs the columns you care about and then sorts them. I mean, that's not easy to do if you're not using Pandas data frames. So it's important that you, you really try to find a way to leverage those uh, in your project, especially if you have tables of data from somewhere. All right, I'm just about out of time. So that's it for um, our online lecture. I will have Q&A with you from 4 to 5 p.m. today. I will uh, try to get this video up to you as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope you learned a lot and got a lot of value out of this. Okay, we'll talk to you later. Bye.